Now, after long last, it's time to actually look at the X300. I hope that you enjoy. Hello and welcome to episode 3 of Project Kodachi. Today we will be taking a look at the X300 laptop itself. If you haven't seen episodes 1 and 2, I really recommend that you go back and cover those because we'll be talking a lot about the end result of that and context is always good. Alrighty, so welcome to episode 3 of Project Kodachi. If you haven't seen the first two episodes, I'll leave a link up here in the top right hand corner for you to check those out. Before we get started today, I thought it would be really important to highlight a couple of books that I actually used during the research of this video. The very first one that was used the most heavily is The Race for Perfect Inside the Quest to the Ultimate Portable Computer by Steve Hamm. As you can tell, on the cover is actually an X300. Steve Hamm actually got an inside look at the development of this laptop and covered it in his book along with a whole bunch of other interesting topics. So if you would like to know more about the X300, where some of my research came from, or computers in general, even ThinkPads, this is a highly recommended book. If you're looking for it, I've left a few links below where you can go ahead and get it. It's a great, easy read if you're not a super technical person. I certainly enjoyed it, and I think you will too. The other book is actually How the ThinkPad Changed the World and is Shaping the Future by Aramasa Naito and William G. Holstein. And this is from the, essentially, what is arguably the developer of the ThinkPad. And there is all sorts of goodies in here about pretty much any ThinkPad project that has been uh, in relatively recent history. So if you're looking for even more detail about ThinkPad line in general, it does mention Kodachi in here along with a few others. I would really suggest that you check this book out as well. Without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at the ThinkPad X300. I'm gonna go ahead and move my awesome 3D printed nameplate out of the way. And let's go ahead and dive right into the specifications of this and then we'll tour the machine like we always do. So first things first, we have an Intel Core 2 Duo SL7100. That was the only CPU configuration for the X300. If you wanted a newer one, you'd have to go to the X301. It did have an Intel Graphics Media Accelerator X3100 a 13.3 inch 1440 by 900 display, LED backlit as we've discussed in previous videos. Your RAM is DDR2, 667 megahertz standard, and you could get a maximum of eight gigabytes, so that would be two sticks of four. Let's go ahead and talk about the hard drive for a second because it, this didn't have a hard drive. It was only ever shipped with an SSD. Now, normally that would be a Samsung 64 gig SSD, and it would be in the 1.8 eight inch micro SATA form factor, which is rare and pretty expensive for what drives really cost nowadays. So what I went ahead and did is I purchased an M SATA adapter kit, put an M SATA drive in there, knowing full well that even with the BIOS unlocked, I'm only gonna get SATA two speeds on this, and that was going to be plenty, and it's worked really, really well. A few other things worth noting is that we do have a modular bay, and I say modular with air quotes because you are having to remove a screw, but the module bay had essentially three options. And the first option, of course, was the DVD multi-burner that we talked about in the design video. We do have a three cell lithium ion bay battery, which I was able to source one. Uh, aftermarket, mind you, but I was able to find one. Thank you very much to Mike Dancy for helping me out with that. And there are third-party drive adapters, but they are unobtainium. I found one on eBay at one point, but then it immediately disappeared. They do have to be seven millimeters thin. They've got a weird connector. It's not standard. Really, really hard to find. A few other things worth noting is that for wireless, you do have an Intel Pro Wireless 4965 AGN which is housed in the mini PCIe Express slot. There is another mini PCIe Express slot in here, but it was pretty much designed to fit uh, a wireless modem and that's it. Uh, wireless USB was also an option, but you're not fitting uh, another MSATA drive in there. There are no lines uh, to support MSATA. Let's go ahead and tour the ports of the machine. 
On the left hand side we'd have the CPU exhaust vent. We have two times USB 2.0. We have access to our drive area. Then we have a headphone and a microphone jack separate. Along the back we have the other side of the exhaust fan. We have another USB 2.0 slot. Our Wi-Fi kill switch is actually located on the back. Our Ethernet port, VGA, as well as our power plug, which is of course the standard power plug for ThinkPad. And along the right hand side we have our Kensington lock slot and then our modular bay. So if you have access to your DVD tray, that's where you would be doing it. A few other things that are worth noting in terms of specs that we don't necessarily see up front is that there is Bluetooth 2.0 in here. And oddly enough, you can install a Bluetooth 4.0 FRU, and I'll leave the specific number up on the screen, and it works without doing a thing. It just runs. So if you're looking to do a Bluetooth update, that's easy, the part is easily found, 10 Canadian dollars gets it, uh, so very inexpensive upgrade. And lastly, in terms of battery options, we have three. So we have a three cell with a 27.3 watt hour, we have a six cell with a 43.2 watt hour, and then we have the battery bay, three cell battery, which normally was around 23.7 watt hours. All together, you can usually get, at least on the Linux version that I'm using, approximately five to six hours of runtime if you're rocking both of those batteries. Still doing a few tweaks to see if I can get that any better. It is worth noting when they were talking about the weight of this machine, very often in literature they would refer to the three cell battery when it made sense to do so. So they were able to meet their objective of the weight of the laptop by referencing the three cell battery. Obviously the six cell battery would weigh more than that and then if you were to use the battery bay on top of that you're just adding additional weight. It wouldn't be a laptop table review unless we went ahead and took some of this apart. So that's exactly what we are going to do. Our first step, of course, is going to be turning this over. We don't need to worry about any internal batteries to disable via the BIOS. We have a catch here that if we move all the way to the left and then shoehorn our finger in there, we can go ahead and remove the main battery. And this is the six cell 43.2 watt hour variant. Once we've gone ahead and get uh, that out of the way, because we actually have the other battery installed, we need to go ahead and remove that too. So we're going to go up here to the screw with the pictogram for the battery bay and or the, uh, the drive. And we're going to go ahead and spin that out of place. Now in my experience, sometimes this does need a magnet to safely remove. And then we can go ahead and remove the second battery. As I mentioned before, this is an aftermarket one, rated at approximately 24 watt hours. After that, it's pretty much standard ThinkPad fare. You follow the pictograms, so that's exactly what we're going to do. So to access our RAM, we're going to go ahead and spin out the two captive screws that are holding on this access cover here. Once we've got that out of the way, cover comes off, and we can see that this one is equipped with two, gigs, uh, two gig sticks for a total of four gigabytes of RAM. Over here we also have our Wi-Fi card. A few other things worth pointing out is that this would be of course our SIM card tray if we did indeed have a SIM card or the modem to read it for that matter. And then over here we actually have the screw that is holding in uh, what would be a drive caddy normally. However, because of the system that I have installed there, uh, we do not have that in fact. What we do have is a board on a board that is being uh, sandwiched in there. Okay, so let's continue with the main event and go ahead and remove our keyboard, which is one additional screw here. And after that, we should just be able to turn this fellow over and go ahead and remove that keyboard as there are only two screws holding it in. This is also a good opportunity just to take a look at that soft touch paint that is all over the place. And I really have to say it feels fantastic. Um, the X220 that I use daily for house use is great, but man, uh, this feel is, is premium. <laughs> all right, so we'll do our infamous keyboard wiggle and we'll go ahead and remove this. 
It is worth noting that the keyboard was not an area that the designers were willing to compromise whatsoever. So when they were designing this, they only made it a fraction of a millimeter thinner, uh, but no more than that because they knew that the keyboard feel was incredibly, incredibly important to all ThinkPad connoisseurs. So they made sure to not compromise where it really counted. We've got access to our CMOS battery hanging out there. Uh, we can see down into where the optical bay cage would be. And then of course we do have our palm rest. And we have a series of two ribbon cables here that are easily disconnected. And then we can continue our disassembly. We can also look in here through this hole and see our drive bay. At any rate, ladies and gentlemen, that's more or less how you're going to access all of the required guts. If you want to replace the palm rest, it's a simple matter of removing the remaining screws and disconnecting these two ribbon cables. Not a whole lot else to see under here. So let's reassemble it and turn it on. All right, with everything back together, let's go ahead and open this up and see how it performs on just a boot test. Keep in mind that this is running an unmodified BIOS currently, so that, that SSD in there is going to be throttled down to say to one speeds. So temper your expectations accordingly. So this is currently running Linux Mint 20 XFCE and is doing phenomenally well you know, with the basic tasks that I've been throwing at it. Uh, it recognizes both of the batteries just fine. It will completely drain one before the other. So that is one thing that battery management needs a little bit of tweaking, but this is entirely still a usable computer and it's a great conversation piece. If you are a person that enjoys ThinkPad history, this is one that I have found is very often overlooked, mainly because it's not a I series, which generally have a bit more longevity. But if you want to talk about lasting legacy, and that is something that we'll be taking a look at in episode five, there is an awful lot to talk about in this particular machine. At any rate, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching episode three of Project Kodachi. For episode four, we are going to be going back in time again to take a look at the reception of this device when it came out, both pros and cons, and, the, and then eventually with episode five, we'll be taking a look at the lasting legacy. I wanna thank all of the people that have supported this project, including David Hill and others who have made uh, all of the information available for me to do this video and have supported me in the acquisition of parts. Thank you so much for watching, and before you go, please consider doing the big four. Please like the video, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so when episode four of Project Kodachi makes its way to YouTube, you'll be the first to know about it. I'll see you next time.